This robot's job is simple. Grab a cube and put it in the basket. The catch is it uses AI that learned everything from how to see the cube, find the basket, moving its joints, from human demonstrations. But here's the challenge. Small changes in lighting or texture can make it fail completely. This challenge was painfully clear to me when I brought my robot to the Humanoids Conference to demonstrate it, and it failed in front of an audience. It just would not pick up the cubes reliably, regardless of how much I tweaked the camera position or the lighting. Inspired by this failure, I set out to build my own cutting edge AI tooling, to learn new skills and to create something open source and practical. The result is a tool that multiplies single human demonstrations into thousands of synthetic examples, helping imitation learning algorithms generalize. In this video, I'll share my journey from setting up the robot and training my first AI policies to building this tool and putting it to the test. Around mid-October, I got these two robot arms. They're unlike most robot arms because they were inspired by projects such as Aloha. These are robot arms specialized for developing in robotics AI policy research. For example, this one here is called the controller. This one actually doesn't have any motors. It's only encoders. While the left one is much heftier. It's got these big motors. It has an actual payload. It's got a camera on it. And it's what I call the follower. The use case for these robot arms is to be able to teleoperate accurately. For example, I can grab this one and move the follower around by just moving the end effector. The idea here is that it makes it possible to collect high quality human demonstration data, even for tasks that require precision. When I got my robot, the first thing I wanted to do was to start testing the basics all the way up to the state of the art techniques for imitation learning. The fastest way to get there was by using LeRobot an awesome open source library made by Hugging Face that implements a lot of these models and provides the tooling to record and view this type of data set. So I cranked away, built controllers for my robot, and added a pull request to the library that adds support for my robot arm to the LeRobot framework. Then, as you can see in the video, I recorded about 50 examples of myself picking up a cube and putting it in the basket using LeRobot plus my integrations. When you do that, what you get is a LeRobot formatted data set. These types of imitation learning datasets tie together robot actions, observations, and state data to provide a complete representation of a given task. This includes visual data like camera feeds or proprioceptive data like joint angles and gripper positions, and can also include external data such as sensor readings or language instructions. The dataset is time synchronized, meaning that for each time step, the observation, action, and state are recorded together. This allows the models to learn the relationship between input observations and output actions over time. So for example, I can stop at a moment in time and see exactly what a frame looked like, what the robot was trying to do, and where it currently actually was. Once I had the data set, I started experimenting heavily. I kept a long spreadsheet of experiments, data sets, and ablations as I debugged issues with my policies. They kept coming out jittery and unstable. Eventually, I figured out that I just didn't have enough data for my robot arm. Once I increased the data set size to about 200 episodes, I had pretty good performance. I was in a bit of a time crunch because I'd signed up with LeRobot to help exhibit with them at the Humanoids Conference. So finally one day before the conference, I was able to get a working policy where the robot could reliably grab green cubes and place them in the basket. I tried to set up the robots exactly the same as I had them at home, but it's just not possible. The camera positions were slightly different, the lighting was different, the table was completely different, and the robot positions were slightly different. This meant that the robot just could not pick anything up to save its life. I think maybe out of 100 tries, it got two or three cube pickups. That's not to say the humanoid conference is a loss. I got to meet the Le Robot team and even play with the 1X robot, Eve, as it teleopted my robot. How meta. So I got home and I was itching to solve this problem. By now, I had more or less caught up on the research and I wanted to start building something useful. I had an idea. Five years ago at the last startup I founded, we were deploying large scale AI video analytics solutions. One of the tools we built to do that was Synthel, a platform for automatically annotating images for the purpose of quickly iterating object detectors for unique objects that don't have large public data sets. Basically, the idea was, can we use simulation to generate lots of training data for object detectors? Luckily, these days, there's actually a lot more tools for that, and you don't even have to build your own platform. I chose Isaac Sim as my platform for this project because I wanted to learn how to leverage it for future projects and because it had some goodies built in. I quickly threw together a raw stack for controlling the robot, integrated Isaac Sim into it in the container, and made it so that I could move real robots in the real world and have them replicate their movements in simulation. I learned how to build Isaac extensions, which I then used to create a tool for recording and replaying trajectories. This is where it gets really cool. So here's how it works. On the left is your physics scene. Prepare whatever environment you want. Don't worry about realism just yet. Just whatever task it is that you want to do. Make sure that you have a dimensionally correct URDF and that all the items are the right size. For this example, I'll just have the robot randomly moving around. I'll show you a real use case in a bit. You press record 
on the right, this is part of my extension, and it'll start saving all the joint data, the physics data, everything that's happening in the scene at a super high frequency, so that later on we can replay that data in slow motion or ultra fast. Stop recording when you're done with the task. It'll save all of that to the file system, and then you can replay that exact scene, but everything is randomized this time. So it'll randomize camera angles, textures, materials, and more. All the settings are configurable right here. So let's go ahead and render this. So right now it's saving all of these images, all the joint data, everything. You can see through the wrist camera that it's been slightly angled, and you can see through the top camera that it's also been moved slightly. Here's what that looks like in practice. On the left is the real robot, providing realistic latencies, joint movements, and responses. On the right is the sim robot that I'm looking at while I make this, copying the exact movements, but actually interacting with the physical environment in the simulation. I'm in control of the robot in the sample. Now here's that same exact sample, but rendered 25 times over using the tool that I built. Note how the robots don't all finish their movements at the same time. That's actually a built-in feature of my tool. It interpolates the joints, meaning it can slow down or speed up the trajectory recordings. That's to help prevent the model from overfitting. I thought that footage was so glorious that I went and rendered every single step of the pipeline so you could see how it looks. The very first step is we vary the lighting. You can see this doesn't make that much of a change, but it does affect the shadows. Then we change the material properties of everything. You start to see some shiny things, some metallics, different colors. It looks a little bit funky. Then we change the textures. This is where things start looking really crazy. It's all over the place. The model at this point can't rely on any specific texture in order to understand the world. Then the next step is we do random scaling. This kind of skews the world a little bit and makes, uh, and makes sure that the model doesn't memorize specific, specific angles. And then we change the speeds. This is that joint interpolation I was talking about. And then the final render in all its glory. It's really nice to look at because every single slot here does look like a unique video. Hopefully the model feels the same. I then went and did that 50 more times, each time varying the cube and cut positions and giving the dataset some variety. I then rendered each recording 18 times, resulting in a dataset of 900 synthetic samples. That would have taken weeks to record, and it still wouldn't have included all the variety in lighting, camera positions, and textures that this dataset has. I converted it to light robot format, as you can see, and I started training a model on those 900 examples. After spending too much on compute, I had a model I could test. The results were actually pretty encouraging if you set your expectations. This model has never seen the real world, and it's been forced to see every example from wildly different camera perspectives. This synthetic data only model was able to pick up the cube about 10% of the time, with some positions where it would just get really confused. It also seemed to hate holding onto the cube, but I actually know why. That's because when I train it, I'm using the joint angles from the real robot arm instead of the joint angles from the synthetic robot arm. So the model's not able to learn that it's actually holding a cube and that that matters. But here's the crazy thing that indicates my hypothesis has value. I was able to move the top camera around pretty drastically and see similar success rates. Here are a few successes. I'm so excited to fine tune the synthetic foundation model with small amounts of real data. If I'm able to use, say, 10x less real data and end up with a model that's robust to moderate camera variation, that's a huge win in my books and for my future conferences. Thank you so much for watching. Special thanks to Remy for the Le Robot Library and all the help on the Discord that I've gotten throughout this project. Please like and subscribe. I'll be posting the next video with all the results from the real data mixed in with synthetic. So be watching out for that and hopefully we'll learn something together. Bye.